Okay, so we are going to go in three, two, one. Lions Lounge Lockdown, episode 43. Darren Morgan, thanks for joining us, mate. Welcome. How are you, mate? I'm very well, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, good, mate. All good, all good. Trying to crack on with the, uh, the class of 88. You was a younger member of that squad. I was. Um, five, six years, five years at Millwall, 86 to 91. Yeah. Uh, local boy, Camberwell. Was you, did you come from a yeah. Millwall family? I didn't. My dad was an Ipswich Town fan, <laughs> which was an odd one. And my, one of my first games was Ipswich Town in the FA Cup. Uh, Millwall at the Den, 6 1 to Ipswich. That was my first game. So, yeah, really? it was an ironic one. So, how did that come about? The old man supporting Ipswich? He lived in Ipswich. He was brought up in Ipswich. Just in that team of that era, Arnold Muir and Franz Tyson was a team to watch, wasn't it? You know what I mean? So, it was a great time. But, um, yeah, I lived on the Aylesbury Estate all my life. My family is still there, funny enough. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I went to a local school and everyone was Millwall. You just get in, ingrained in it, didn't you? It just takes over you. Yeah, so you, you, you went and watched as a kid that you were a Millwall fan yourself? I did. I sort of got transformed into a Millwall fan. Yeah, once I started going, uh, yeah, it just takes over you. Yeah. All the boys were, all my mates, every single one was a Millwall fan. We had an odd, odd one out, but there are not many of them. But yeah, we just, just lovely days. Fantastic time. How did you get to come to the club? Did you didn't come for the, did you come for the youth system or not? Yeah, I was there very, very early. I was there, <coughs> I was there about uh, 11, 12 years of age. Uh, I went to Wolf School in the old Kev Road. I got into um, South London schools uh, with Nick Milo, who was the manager at the time, was looking after our team. Um, and it was a natural, naturally, that Joe Wilson, the old scout at Millwall, would always attend the games and he had sort of had rich pickings, really. Picked everyone from the South London team that was a, that you know thought they'd, they'd like to see, and it sort of grew from there. Must be a dream come true, mate. Playing for the fucking team you grew up, literally up the oh, road. Was, I mean, it was great times. I mean, the first year Doc took over was tough. You you can hear everything they say when you've got three thousand Millwall fans in the den <laughs> screaming <laughs> screaming at you and saying the things about your wife and your old lady. Yeah, it's lovely, it's fantastic. But then you know you you kind of get used to it, didn't you? But, yeah. uh, yeah, it's, it's it, if you can't if you can play at the old den, you can play anywhere. Can't yeah, true, mate. Very, very true. Well, f- from from an outside of the outside of the stands looking in, I, I would assume, yeah, that um, it's uh, definitely character building, isn't it? Cool. Yeah, it makes it, it does. I mean, in the earlier days when Doc first came, remember there was only one sub, and that was predominantly me in the first yeah. year, and we used to spend a lot of time together. <laughs> that big cigar of his poisoning me. Um, I remember one game at Stoke and went out there and they absolutely pelted me with everything. I've never heard abuse like it. And I thought, I went back to the dugout and he went to me every 15 minutes, go on, go go down the line. I said, no, nah, I think this, this dugout's big enough for me to warm up in here. So that's where I stayed most of the time. You know, but everything was an experience. You know what I mean? Everything, just character built. It's all weird, really. You either, you either go with it or you fail. So you come through the youth team. Who, who came through with you? Anyone we would know? I was with um, Neil Ruddock, Brian Orn. Um, Sean Sparham, uh, Nicky was Nicky and Teddy. I played in the same youth team. I was younger, but I played with Nicky and Teddy. Um, so those are the players that you would know of, or we're all fans would know of. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was a good team, good, good time. You know, Ted was always going to be exceptional, even when he was a kid. Nicky was a great, grateful, uh, great defender. Um, all he was an exceptional goalkeeper. Even then, showed uh, shot stopping. Tomo, a big Tomo, he came down very early. Um, and it was always going to be something different, you know. He's still still as mad, as, still mad now as he was then. Still can't understand a word he says. We have to have a translator, but you know, yeah. Every now and again, you get the odd word out. Him and Alan Dowson together. Well, that's a combination. Yeah. He kept um, yeah, he mentioned Alan Dowson a few times. So you came through the youth system. Who, yeah. um, what was the short shitty jobs you had as, as apprentices? And whose boots did you have to we, Yeah, we had to do the boots. So mine was. I was a I was an apprentice uh, with George Graham and Theo Foley. George Graham manager Theo Foley assistant, and that was tough being under them. Really hard. They were George. George was a tough man to play with, to be with. He really was. He signed me pro, George. And the day I was supposed to sign pro, they left me there for three hours and forgot I was there. So I, went, I walked off. I just went. I didn't come back. I disappeared for two days, and then Bob Pearson got in touch with me. So what's happening? I told them. I said, so you do a two-year apprenticeship and they leave you sitting there for a year. So I said, no, it's not for me. 
And so I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna sign from her, I was gonna leave it. Um but George wanted to see me first time that she spoke to me, I think in two years, and apologized and asked me to sign the contract. And I did. I was always wanting to, but I was quite stubborn like that. If I don't treat you well, I'll move on. And that's what I did. Uh, but I signed it, he apologized, and we become, you know, he gave me my first break, really. He gave me the first game I played was well, what was it? Uh in I think one of those silly cups, similar cup or a cup or an old cup like that, uh, against Orient at the Den. Uh, his first game. So he gave me my debut. Uh, which is good. Mate, that is fucking brilliant. You're mm. a youngster. Got yeah. a bit of South London, you're there, mate. I'm not fucking out. I don't care if you're George Graham, mate. I'm not fucking having this. I walked, I walked out. The, the two, the two, the um who was in charge? It was the Shores. Remember the Shores with Chief Executive and Secretary Tony Shaw and Sylvia Shaw. And the funny thing was, because Joe Miller, the physio, told me later on after, they, they still didn't even realise I'd gone. So I could have been there all night. I thought could when you said, like, with... you know, he left me sitting there for three hours, I thought he was going to say, like, he knew you was there to test the character, do you know what I mean? Just to see, see if you're young around. No, I didn't come back for two days. <laughs> I didn't answer the phone. No one knew where I was. And I think Bob come round. I said, what's going on? I told him. He went, nah, not even that. So I said, well, nor am I. So, and at the time... You know, I was playing for, um, I, I had an opportunity to play for Wales at school, at school board level and England, and I opted for Wales, I opted to play for Wales. And I would always play for them, doing really well. And I was confident in my own ability, I wasn't worried about that. And I just thought, you know what, don't take this. You know, you put an apprenticeship through an apprenticeship under George Graham, which is not easy. Uh, I mean, Teddy and Nick will vouch for that. We made it through, and then you treat me like a little bit, little bit of rubbish, leaving it sitting me in the corner. No, I was off, so that was that. You know, he had to come to me in the end. <laughs> yeah, George had to come, come back. He had to come back. On fair play, though, like you, you stuck it out and he apologised to you. And I, I can't yeah, see that George Graham's apologised to many down the years. No, I mean, we had a lot of respect. I ran into him a few times after that. Always very respectful to me. Always had a good relationship with him after that, obviously. Because um, as a schoolboy, as a, sorry, as an apprentice, George had very little time for you. I mean, we had a very good team. Yeah, very long time for you. George knew where he was heading and he wanted to get to where he was very quickly. And he'd done the work with the rest of his history. Isn't it? Yeah. But you can't knock him for that. So you'd already you'd already played in the first team under George? Yes, yeah. Oh, so yeah. You, what was that, 86? Eight... Oh, uh, I, yeah, it was probably then, 86, yeah. Is that when we was like, struggling yeah. at the back end of League One? Like, what would be now be League One? Uh, no, I think under George was... We may have been in Div 2, the old Div 2 at the time, straight as uh, trying to stay up. So I think the year we stayed up, uh, we, we won at Chesterfield mm. when Coos scored the penalty the last game, the following year, or whenever that was. I think that, that Doc signed the next year as manager, I'm not sure. I can't remember. I think they went on to, sorry, they went on to get promoted the following year. And I think in that summer, George went to Arsenal. Yeah, yeah. What was he like, Razor, being a, being a white sea with Razor? Oh, he's, he's always been the same. It's just a bit larger now. You know what I mean? A bit larger. Than, he's always been the same. He's he is what he is. He's just he's just just a big kid. He just enjoys life and he gets on with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fantastic left foot, good player. And he always like he's just like Ted. Ted remembers we all we all grow up together. When we get together, we're all still friends. Nothing changes. Whatever what's ever happened in life when we're together for that three, four, five hours, it's just a great time. Fantastic, yeah. I think he refers to his Millwall, his Millwall players as his mates anyway. We still all mates, we still get on. There's a group chat. We all still keep in touch, you know. Well, the first year John Doc took over, I made my league debut. Yeah, which was against yeah, Bradford City at home. I played right back. Got it. Two one. We lost. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. And played well. Uh, right back it was a new experience, but uh, I played right back initially for. My debut, I was in the youth team. I was in the reserves. I'd play fullback, right back, or midfield. Um, in the youth team, I played uh, midfield. All right. But yeah, so I started off in, I think I played, I don't know how many games I played there, but 22, I played numerous positions. 22 games you played that year, scored two goals. Oldham oh, away sure. in the FA Cup. Um, sorry, that was Oldham away, and another one, two Cardiff. goals. Cardiff City in the Cup. That's it, Carly C. That was it. Mm. Well, whoever read those all the facts and figures has only ever put me down for three goals. I scored four goals. You've got to put him right. 
<laughs> I've got it, mate. I've got, the Wiki, yeah. Wikipedia says too, and I've, I've been through every every kick you pretty much had for us. Very yeah. interesting one later on um, in, in one of your last seasons of the club. We'll get on to that. Let's talk about the 87-88 yeah. season, of course. Mate, mm. it must have been, what was you, 20 years old at this point? Dream come true. There was only one sub. No, two subs. Mm. Uh, two subs were allowed at that time. And uh, I was spent a lot of time on the bench in the first two seasons with, with Doc. Mm. First season was only one, was, uh, predominantly it was me. Um, and in the second season, I spent a lot of time with Dean Oryx, God bless him. Uh, you know, so he'd always go on as if he was needed up front or either side or a winger, and I'd go on in any defensive role or midfield. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a question I wanted to ask you about. You've really let it on nicely for me. I spoke to Tom about this yesterday. And I said, you know, in this day and age, five five subs can come on at the minute because obviously COVID. Seven, you know, yeah. 19 travel. You have the 18 for the 19th man. But back then, yeah. you know, how did you cope with that? I mean, Tomo seemed to embrace it. It was like, as long as I got to put my blazer on and go to the away games, I didn't care. Like, you know, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll fucking bribe the dock with, with 20 ammo <laughs> and I'll be flying. Do you know what I mean? How oh, yeah, you- yeah. I mean, no, I mean, you just go on with it. You was, I, was, I was lucky to be that person. It didn't really worry me too much mm. that. Anyone got injured, I would go on in their position, wherever it may be. I was just happy to play. I was quite fortunate that I was considered that I could play in numerous positions. Yeah, and I was yeah. quite fortunate like that. Um, so it was easy for me. Um, and they they trusted me with that. I mean, I came on once uh, in the Simul Cup in the, in the first half and Doc stuck me out front with Ted. I don't know if you remember the game. And then I played the whole of the second half with Ted. We won 3-0. And according to them, I was very, very good, exceptional, and done things that you know that normal forward would be. I just played. I enjoyed playing. I was very technically. I was very lucky. Uh, you know, quite quite a clever footballer. Yeah. And I put myself in the right positions and did the right things at the right time. Funny enough, I see um, a picture pops up on social media, so I shared it. You're you're one of the first players ever, I reckon, to do a no look pass. Have you seen the photo? I'll put <laughs> I it on the screen. I'll put it on, I'll put it on the screen for the viewers now. You won't see it yourself, obviously, but. It's like a proper. Yeah. It was a weird one. I had to explain that. I had to explain that to a few people. But <laughs> luckily, on that day, it was my birthday. I think it was, just, I think it was the 5th of November. It was 21. It beat Luton, wasn't it? Is that right? Beat Luton. Luton, yeah, yeah. And after the game, all the boys come down to my local pub in West Walden Road. And we had a good time. But yeah, it was a, you know, it was the, the, the season we went up was, was unbelievable in the sense that we didn't really talk too much. Not in my not in my presence anyway, about actually getting there, getting there, we're gonna go there, we're gonna make it, we're gonna make it. I think it only really hit home in the game, the the, the game before Hull. I think it was Stoke City, wasn't it? We won two 0 And we all got in the bath because you had a big bath and we all could sit the whole team. We got there and we thought, you know, we've got a chance of winning this one. But it didn't occur to me until that point, and people were very, very laid back in their approach to talking about it. So mm. Probably wasn't it's a bad great. thing, to be fair, was it? So in the 86, 87 season, we finished 14th. And then 87, 88, a lot of the same players, Teddy, the Mount Alan McCleary, yeah. Rhino. We made a few additions, Chicken George, <laughs> Kevin O'Callaghan and um, Steve Wood. Cass was a big difference, wasn't he? Cass was a great difference. I mean, playing with Ted, Cass and Ted, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, Cass was very mobile as well. People take it for granted, but he was very, very mobile. And he scored some great important goals. You know, but easy to play with. They both were. They complemented each other fantastically well. Mm. You said um, as well about Chicken George. You got on well with George. George was a lovely man. George had a few injuries, bless him. He, he, his knees played up, but yeah, he was. George was a George on his day was fierce. He could play. He just slotted into into a mill. We lived at Bexley Heath. I used to live up in Welling. He used to live at Bexley Heath. We spend a lot of time together, but. He didn't really get a fair crack, mm. Georgie. Uh, the, deli- uh, the injuries affected him. And the fact that he was getting injured when the team was doing very well, you know. So um, that's what happens sometimes. You get left behind. Of course, of course. You said that you, um, you know, Tomo said as well, good camaraderie in the squad, really good. You were oh, yeah. a younger, younger part of that squad. Did you did you feel fully part of it? Because Tomo said oh, something yeah. you felt a little bit on the fringes, but... No, I mean, I... Uh, when you mentioned the first season when we finished 14th, when I made, I made a joke with you about being down to Dan and hearing everything that they say when there's 3,000 people in. Mm. That 
was like the even Doc said, that bedded a lot of the young players in the first year in the Football League. Um, gave them a chance to be at one of the toughest places you could do an apprenticeship or be a young player. So that boded well for everyone who was part and parcel of that of that year. And then what they had what they added to the in the with the quality that they bought just took us to another other stage. And we just steamrolled, you know, just kept on going. And as it and even when in the first year when they had a premiership, it just carried on then. It just steamrolled, it steamrolled. Mm. And our camaraderie was a massive part of that. Yeah. Who, who was like sort of the leader of that? Who sort of run that dressing? Was there any characters in particular? There was just too many. We had a little pockets of people. You had a younger element, you had you had tell and we had, we had all pockets of people that we all come together a, a lot, but then people do their own things. It, you know, you could jump into anyone's car that you wouldn't normally be in with, or, you know, you could jump in with Tomo or they could jump in with me or could jump in with whoever, Ted or, you know, there's just, whoever was going, jump in. You know, mm. who wants a drink, we're off. You know, we did drink. There was a drinking culture in the day. We used to go out together. And there was always quite a lot of us. Uh, if we used to do a midweek game, we'd all get together. Can help that, mate. Kind of that little togetherness off the pitch can definitely fucking help. It makes a massive difference to us. It makes a massive difference because you know, you know, at the end of the day, our team was very, very. It was a very tough team. You know, wherever you go in the country, wherever I've been, people talk about Terry, but Rhino was the one he was most feared. You know, Rhino was everything he was. Just an animal. He was an, a horrible, horrible, nasty animal. He had this unique way of unique way of trying to interpret that he wasn't treading on you he was treading over you but he managed to find your ribs or your legs or your or your arm or your hand he managed to always stamp on you he had off to a fine art you used to you used to didn't mind uh, implementing that in training either did he we yeah at some of our training that's the thing back then it's like pitches weren't great and we used to tell would never tell would never tackle tell was like a mouse in training you know he just he just get through but and they'll save it for match day but yeah rhino was he, he trained as he played that was the nature of it unfortunately so he was he was um he was a sub not used we spoke about this brief, briefly 27 times that yeah. season did you did you feel yeah. like you struck up a better relationship with the doc and mcclintock more than others like did players sometimes go to you what's he saying about me the doc? <laughs> you know I mean? no i mean doc me and doc we formed a very good relationship in the first year he took over anyway um, him being a little man and being a very good winger uh, apparently at the time and when he used to train he had a great, great right for him to do some lovely crosses so he, we, we struck up a good relationship because for a simple reason he saw me I was small and I'd get stuck in he had a lot of time for me and you know the, Bob Pearson uh, being at the club who held me in high regard like he did everyone else he bought through because obviously Bob bought me through um, <coughs> and he just he could see the people that wanted to give it a go and all the homegrown players were, were, keen, to, were keen to to crack on, really. You know. Yeah. You said about Bob Pearson, mate, and I, I, I say this on every interview, so apologies to the to the viewers. Mm. He seems to be like a timeless figure at Millwall. Everyone from the 80s, the 90s, the noughties, yeah, Bob, Pearson, Bob Pearson brought me to the club. I tried to get yeah. my shaft off, I don't think he's too well at the minute, but... Uh, no, he's not been well for a while, no. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, Jesus, it's underrated what he did. I can remember playing... Um, a game at Southampton when I was about 11, 12. And uh, I hadn't met Bob and we mm. beat him about 4 0 while I was playing right back. And he came over to me, it was quite strange. He came over to me, he put, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said to me, You will never leave this football club and one day you will captain our first team. I was going, Okay. Cool. <laughs> Is that for a confidence yeah. boost though? Yeah, I think captain first team, but I'm, I'm, I'll play. <laughs> you know, but he, uh, he was just like, you know, he just. He never played the game, but he had this unique eye, you know. Uh, and he was very fortunate because he had some good players at comfort. Yeah, mate. You know. he, he done some, I mean, until we started doing his interviews, probably some un, some very decent unsung work, but now he, he's getting full recognition from a lot of lot of ex-players. Oh, yeah. I mean, like Alan McCleary, we had, some of us had some very, I had some very good relationship with Bob. Uh, Alan McCleary was very close. Ted was very close. All me. He always spoke to you, he had time for you, always got to, made a point of getting to know your family. You know, I came, my, I come from one parent family and my dad was going to every game. They always made a point of making sure my dad was all right and so forth. It was just, it was just different then. Mm. Now they're probably, football clubs have probably got 200 people that are looking after everyone. You know what I mean? It's ridiculous. Yeah, but yeah. back then it was more personal. It was very personal. 
Brilliant. So despite yeah. the, uh, you know, he's coming through, he was only young at the time, so I suppose he wasn't getting too frustrated. He wasn't knocking on the gaffer's door, but you did start in a very important game. Bournemouth away, you started that match. Yeah, I'd been, I hadn't trained. I'd been out of a knee ligament injury and I hadn't trained for three or four weeks before the game. And I had sort of had an inkling that, was inkling that he might want to put me in at left back because Nicky and both Sean were injured at the time. I don't know if Sean was injured, but I know Nicky definitely was. And he came, he was going to put me in left back. I never played left back before my life. And uh, I just got through the game on sheer adrenaline, really. I mean, it was, it was, it wasn't, I mean, the right winger at the time was that pacey kid who used to be at Tottenham. And I thought, oh, that's all I need. He'd be running me ragged, but he didn't, didn't touch the sides of me all day. It was a tough game. We got through, good performance, great. Terry's goal, great goal, all these penalty save. <coughs> and again, it was like, it was character building. Everything, everything was character building. You know? I'm, I love the way you're coming across. Like you said, good wing of idea. Didn't get, didn't touch the sides. I love that. Well, I thought, I, I thought he was going to run me, but he didn't, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, got into him early, a couple of digs, and that was it. But yeah, back then, it's, I mean, we talk about now, I mean, I was quite a tough player and I, I put myself about. And any injury I got was always from contact. It was never a strain or anything like that. But um, it couldn't, I couldn't play in this game now. It'd be ridiculous. Oh, my God. It'd be impossible, be impossible to have any contact. You know, the smaller players had to make contact. They had to be physical. Otherwise, they'd just get brushed aside. And that's what we did. But it's not for me now. I very. I don't even watch football. Don't even watch it now. I know what you mean. I only really watch Mere Wall. Do you think growing up watching Mere Wall sort of forged the player you, you became? You understood what, what, what was involved, the DNA and becoming a Mere player? Yeah. I mean, you have, you have to, any any club and the clubs I went after, any any clubs, you've got your own personal pride anyway. So you want to, you want to, you want to give a good performance, good account of yourself and, and help your team. But I think with Mere Wall, just a natural you would soon be told from whatever stand if you weren't doing it. You could hear it. And it normally followed a bit of abuse about your family, which was fine. It comes with the territory. But if you couldn't take it, then you shouldn't be here. You know, it's, you know, I mean, I was in the Coldwell Lane in one game with a good friend of mine, Big Mark Mack, standing behind the goal. And there was this fella slagging me off terribly. He thought I was on the pitch. And my mate tapped on his shoulder and said, he's here. What's the matter with you? He's standing beside us. <laughs> oh, dear. You can get that. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, so, the Bournemouth game, you said no one really mentioned up until that point and whispers yeah. started going around the change. It was probably a good thing because you was relaxed about it. On that journey home from Bournemouth, did it really start with it? Hang on, this is fucking, this is actually going to happen here. Well, I think, um, I don't know if the Leeds game was before or after Bournemouth. I'm not sure. Because I think the Leeds game where we won up there 2 1, I think the two games that season was obviously Bournemouth and Leeds sort of epitomised where we was heading, that we could go all the way. And um, yeah, I think the players, I mean, I, I mean, George, uh, sorry, uh, Frank and Doc were, they was beside themselves coming home from Bournemouth because obviously we had a patched up team to a degree. And, it, and we didn't really play too well down there. But what we did is, we always hung in there. We always battled. We always made it hard for the opposition. If we weren't on song, we always made sure that they weren't at their full max either. And that was the difference. We, we always put ourselves about and made it hard for them. Mm. And of course, you got the job done at Hull. What's your memories of yep. that day? Obviously, you was on the bench that day. Yeah. I mean, my dad was there. We had a pub from the Bricklayers Arms, a, a coach from the Bricklayers Arms in Westmoreland Road go up. And my dad was there with an old friend of ours. And he was crying like most people were at the time. I, I ran into a couple of uh, friends on the pitch. Um, just when I can remember when the final was, I just automatically got up and just drifted onto the pitch and was just like running, like just jogging around, thinking in, in a daze, really. It mm. was, I mean, it was, we got into the changing room before the game and there were six bottles of champagne under the under the side. Got them rid of them. You know, they've already, <laughs> they'd already accepted that we were going to be champions. Hold before we'd even played them, which was amazing. But, um, yeah, it's just what dreams it made of, really. And mm. we went back to the hotel. I remember having a conversation with everyone at the bar. The chairman didn't realise that we was got a, a cheque for winning the league. I think it was 25 grand at the time. He was bewildered. And so he basically said to John, Doc, book the players a holiday. Take them where you want. Mm. You know, we ended up going to Barbados for two weeks, which 
We've heard, bit, we've heard bits about this trip. Can you share any more? Yeah. Oh, he was, he was just, all I could say is it was the first, we went on British West Indies Airlines on the plane with Maxi Priest and his band. That was on the plane. We drank the plane to right. Maxi Priest invited us to his gigs. We went, a few of us went back stage with him. He was from Broccoli. He was a Mill fan. Fantastic time. And the first air tours plane from Manchester was first flight out there the day we the day we was out there. So that's how long that was. It was just an amazing place. But we didn't need anyone outside. There was 27, 28 of us. Yeah, yeah. It was paradise. We're in paradise having a fantastic time. Imagine growing up in Camberwell, could, you, could you, someone said to you, went back in time and said to you as a boy, when you grow up, you're going to play with me or you end up going from Camberwell to Barbados. You must be thinking, no, you're, you're right. <laughs> you don't, well, so my first, my first playing journey is when I played for Wales against Northern Ireland, it was from, um, from Manchester to Belfast. I didn't realise I couldn't fly. I was sick all the way. Oh. So that was my first plane journey. And my second one was Barbados. And I'm thinking, I'm on a plane here for 12 hours and I can't make 40 minutes. So, you know, but it's, it, you know, I went, we went to Australia, we went to Penang, we went to, we went all around the world with the club. It was just like, it was just fantastic time. So I thought, I mean, I've been heard bits about this trip. I assume it was a pre season tour, but it wasn't. It was an end of season jolly. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Barbados was an end of season jolly. Two weeks of unbelievable. Yeah, it was fantastic. I was still getting used to the drinking culture. I was sick most nights. Uh, George, George put me in bed most nights, but you know, it's, it is. It is what it is. It's just what it's made you. Really, I shouldn't drink. I spent so many years getting sick. I should have turned the in a long time ago. But there you are. Yeah. But now we've got two pubs. <laughs> yeah, that's about to say. Yeah, yeah. Got to that later. You must have, you must yeah. have got better along the years, surely, only two pubs. Well, yeah, only slightly. Had me a moment. <laughs> slightly, I'm sure. So we skipped over because we spoke about Hull, we spoke about Bournemouth, but in between and obviously the Barbados trip, we've missed out the final day at home to Blackburn. I was subbed that day with Dean. Um, Doc and intended. Docker intended to put us on at some point, but um, it weren't going. It weren't going the right way, was it? It wasn't going the right way. So I think, I think some of the still, we're still on the beach in Barbados. Some of them weren't they? Yeah, we were still. It's very hard to get motivated when you've already done it. You know oh, what I exactly. mean? And uh, we spent the rest of that week, you know, just in, in, in Disneyland, didn't we? So you know, reading the paper, just enjoying the adulation. It was. Mm. It was unique, and it was just great to be a part of. Really, yeah. and in the eighty-eight, eighty-nine season, you're you're from the area. You're what would be now Premier League footballer. It's just yeah, sound, I bet you couldn't believe it. But <laughs> I mean, don't get well, up better than that. Joe, so, it was it was the same for a few of us because we all grew up together. We played together. We was all playing at the same time, and I know others went on to be played a good career and. Teddy was exceptional to watch. It was just a great, great time. And time goes so fast. You know, I'm 53 now and you think, oh, God, I remember when I was 21 and they said, look, you always talk about your pension. Pension, I'm 21, what's the matter with you? Yeah, now I'm 53. And I wish I'd spoke about my pension at 21. One of those things, you know. But, yeah, it's, 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 you can't put a value on, on, on the years mm. because it is, it's, they're just memories that last forever. And you... um. So, obviously, first season, the top flight. We finished 10th. You made 11 starts that season. More starts yeah. than you did in the league below. Did you have yeah. that little chat with Doki at some point? Say, look, no, no, so it was a just, player now. just, just, you just a circumstance. Player? No, I, I, I kind of accepted, and it, it would be wrong not to, that at that time, I, I, was, I would play if Teddy or, oh, sorry, if uh, Les or Terry was injured. And yeah. that became the case to a degree. Um, I don't think I played anywhere apart from midfield. So it's only when one of those was injured and I might have got an extended run. And I did well. I don't think even the games we lost, they held me own. And it was, yeah, it was, a, it was, it was interesting time, you know, but um, yeah, it was a great season. We tailed off towards the end. I think we got a bit, a bit tired uh, or teams were starting to play a little bit, catch up on us a little bit, yeah. technically maybe. I don't know. But um, I said what I said, but it's, mate, it's a hell of a fucking partnership to try and break, isn't it? I'm not saying you weren't well, a good player, but Jesus Christ. It is. It is the most fiercest of all time. You know what I mean? It's, it's, so to break it down at 21, 22, when they're in their peak, you know, it's, it's a tough one for, for Doc. I gave him I gave him an hard time and decision sometimes, but 
he always just went with the experience and, and rightly so rightly so did you learn a lot from from les and terry as a player oh yes tells they were both different to play with tell was tell was very technically very very good player mm. uh, and all that his physique got him into trouble more more often than not you know uh you put yourself about, but his physique used to knock him out of the way, and, and the refs, ref formed the, they formed an opinion of him anyway, didn't they? Before yeah. he even started, Les was more vocal. Les was a great engine, you know. Les was very good technically as well. It was just, just a great time, and I think whenever I played with either or either, we complemented each other quite well. So it worked for me. They, they led me to believe as a youngster that if I'd done everything right, and it was all looking good, and at times. You know, I deserve to stay there a lot longer. I know yeah. that, but it is what it is. Yeah. Sometimes I think, and Tomo said the same, a good manager will will keep your player happy even if they're not getting in so much. Did Doc do that job well on you? Well, it's hard. It all depends where you want to be. I think yeah. we were still very young. So of course, in the part of somebody that was very successful. Exactly. So to be a part of that, of that even if it's a squad player, was fantastic. But uh, there, does, there does come a time when you... When you're playing and you're doing very well, mm. you should you should remain really. Yeah. Uh, so it was hard. That you did start very important game in the day in our history because QPR at home three two win. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then what happens after that, that day? If the result comes in, we're top of the shop. Yeah, I remember that. Remember that game well. Um, leading up to that game, I think Doc Doc had a dilemma to play either he was contemplating playing either me or Neil Raddick in midfield. Right. And I think um, he opted for me. And Tell and I, as I said, Tell and I always played quite well together. And I did very rarely watch the videos of any of the games because I'm so, so I don't. I'm, it's just the way I think. But I did watch that one. We played really well that day. Yeah. Really, really well. Some good touches and good things. And the tempo was a fantastic. No Briley or Salmon. Darren Morgan, at the age of 20, coming in for his first division debut, wearing eight. Herlock having a hand. In number one. Cascarino, out in! Tony Cascarino, as Nicky Johns looks accusingly at his defenders. A characteristically splendid header from Tony Cascarino after 13 minutes has put the Lions in front. Steen's ball. And now Francis. And Francis, you shot. Oh, it's crept in. Trevor Francis has equalised. In Rangers, first real attempt on goal. And that might perk Rangers up a bit because they spent a lot of time going backwards, but they could be in trouble now because they've let Herlock in and Cascarino onside. And the goal is given. Well, Rangers giving it away as soon as they've got one back. Wood chip forward. Cascarino eventually crowded out. And Herlock catches them again, and Herlock hits one. Oh, it's a third. Terry Herlock has got it himself. It was a great game to watch. And after the game, talking to the QPR players, they were bamboozled by us. They just said, like, they were completely in awe of us, really. So, yeah. Which was fantastic. Especially like top top league teams coming to that, to the den and all like, Doc, oh, yeah. we hear stories about the, the players actually going to macros and getting a boost, run the bar, Doc's office always gets a mention like... Oh, yeah, we used to charge them a fortune back in the day. And when the Northern teams used to come down, we used to charge them, Ryan run the bar, so you, you, you're going to get ripped off anyway. Ryan had run the bar. <laughs> so he used to charge them two or three pound a can of John Smith's or something back in the day. And they used to they used to scream and cry, say, well, you want it or not? Don't want it, go and piss off. It's up to you. You know, it's one of those things. But um, they always paid. And, uh, yeah, right, Rhino... Made sure they paid and all, so but it's just it's just my wall, you know, That's, the way it is. That just you, you know, what I mean, this day and age, I mean, Gary Rowett behind the bar serving the drinks, like bumping up the prices. With yeah. like Alex Pierce, that price oh, was, was applicable to when we played. Yeah, you said you don't watch football anymore. It's just like it just isn't what it was, was it? Yeah, it's not. I mean, you know, apart from everyone refers to the money. Money wasn't never a driving force for me. It was. You know, my dad used to come and watch, and he was proud. He used to be so proud of his son playing for the local team and being successful and playing, you know, played for his country at youth level and be international. So those were the things that were important to me. I was only young, making my way. Yeah. And, you know, money would follow. In time, 
you know, your money scale goes up depending on your experience and, mm. and so forth and so forth. But it wasn't a driving force for me at all. Yeah, no, exactly. It's too many players these days are just they're in it for the for the for the for the yeah. game, not for the game, for the money. Yeah. A couple of other games I picked out that year, Old Trafford, 3-0 loss. Uh, yeah. did, you play, did you play in that game at all? Yeah, I played in that game, yeah. Yeah. We got back to uh just a funny story about that. Well, we got back to a pub in Tarbridge Road, I forget the name of it now. And I was having a pee in the toilet and a Millwall fan came over to me and said, What are you doing in here? You just got beat 3 0. You're a disgrace. You should go home. I said, Mate, last year we was two years ago, we was playing in front of three thousand people. Behave yourself, you know. <laughs> What's the matter yet? You, you don't know, take no, no one, I can tell like the way you cut you don't take no shit. And you know, not no, we think you don't, yeah, we're renowned for being quite a short player as well. But you, yeah. you ain't having no shit off no one, aren't you? No, we don't, it's, you know, we carried on in life. But at the end of the day, we we all got spoiled. We all got spoiled to a degree, and we was a victim of our own success, the club in a short space of time. But what you see now is consistency. It's managing that. Mm. It's managing it. Any team in the Premiership or Championship is managing that success. It's managing that process. Mm. And Doc was very, very loyal to his squad. It's arguable whether he should have made changes. Could have made changes. He could have added. You know, those arguments have all were all, all all to be had, and they're still being had now. It's on my notes in a minute. We'll get on with the relegation season. Uh, that's literally yeah. led me on perfectly. But before we do that, there is one game from my own personal memories that I want to speak about. And that was, you know, 87, 88, I was seven and eight then. So that's sort of the first sort of team I remember. Yeah. So I was, at the time I was spoiled because I didn't realise what was actually happening. I thought, oh, it's where me and yeah. fucking top flight. No, no. I'll always remember <laughs> the Norwich game at home because it was the first time yeah. I was in the game, but we was also on the telly and I couldn't believe that me and on the telly. Yeah. The Brian yeah. Moore commentator, what a game. I think you played a part that day in one of the goals as well, didn't you? Yeah, I think the Jimmy's goal, I think someone, a, a good friend of mine, a, a, a Millwall fan, he, uh, he told me it was the most passes that he'd ever seen in one move of a Millwall team. But if you ever will get a chance to watch it from the start, from the, I think it comes about 33 or 34 passes in that move from either side of the pitch and back round. Three minutes of the first half remaining. Herlock to Morgan. Sheringham to Morgan, a great little run by him, a Cascarino, and it's hit there by Carter! 2-2! That was a great game. Uh, we should have won, hands down, but, you know, another great game on TV. Mm. Mm. Unfortunately, you just mentioned it, and it is in my notes, as I said, in 1988, sorry, not the 1989-90 season, the wheels come off. Um, and we yeah. got relegated, of course. John Ducky got sacked. This is an amazing fact from this season. If I'm right, I hope I'm right. I think I've done my research. You only started one league game all season. Yeah. And it was against Man United and you scored. Yeah, yeah. I've been out. At the end of the uh, first season, what's now the Premiership, I had a, I, I crushed a disc in my spine. <laughs> Jesus. And, that? Um, uh, just wear and tear. And I was the first... I was the first contact sportsman ever to have an operation uh, in London Bridge Hospital. Um, microsurgery, they burnt away the disc and they let it heal naturally. Normally you'd have pins and so the other. So I was the first contact sportsman in the world to have that operation. And so it took a while for me to recover. And I, I, used to, I struggled a bit in my first game back. I was left in the wilderness a bit because you had one physio back in the day, not like now, you probably have 10. Mm. So you have one physio and he has to look after the injured players that are likely to uh, are likely to be fit imminently, whereas I was long-term. So I came back. I was written off to a degree at times, which is the truth. Um, if and but whether I'd play again at the level. So when I got the opportunity to play, uh, I hopefully done, showed up for it and said, well, I'm still here. You know what I mean? Mm. Talk us through the goal. I'm going to show it on the screen as well. Very little, really. I remember I always I was very lucky. It was always at a very good leap. I could enter a ball. No problem at all. I could I could compete with the big boys and enter a ball. And I just remember the cross coming in. I remember just getting my head going bang and then Mike feeling headbutting and right in. Mm. Knocked me out for a minute. And it, the, the ball just carried. I thought it was 18 yards out. So just carried over the over the goalkeeper's head. Didn't really get a chance to celebrate. As I said, I was on the floor and seeing, seeing Canaries. Got it hard. That's nicely done. 
Carter. Skipping past McLeod. Appeared to strike Anderson on the arm, but play waved on. Morgan! Oh, yes! Well, he's picked up a nasty knock in the process. Morgan back on his feet. Let's hope he remembers it. So, um, do you, uh, do you yeah. remember it? I didn't. They didn't like you. Didn't like jog your memory forever. Like got rid of it. No, no. I mean, I played really, really well that day. Uh, was playing on adrenaline, but you know, um, we could play. I mean, we played really well. I can remember Cash saying that with the service he had that day was second to none. If we'd had the service like that, it might have changed. But it's hard because I think sometimes when you get when you get in a role, I think in the second season a lot of teams suss me all out to a degree. Changes, yeah, should changes be made. Doc was very loyal to his team. Uh, we underperformed, but we started the season very well. I think we're actually in the top three. We just fell, we just fell away. Just fell away. I can remember we, uh, I was in the stand at um, Tranmere in the FA Cup. We lost in the FA Cup uh, that year, Tranmere. Kenny Dalglish was there. He was watching the game. He got out of his chair and he said to a group of people, Millwall have lost their bike. And he didn't even finish watching the game. He went after 20 minutes. And so he came to watch us. He went after 20 minutes. He said, we all lost their bike. Okay, no. so, so a lot of people were of, a, were of the same opinion, I'm sure. Yeah, well, listen, uh, myself and I'm sure a lot of others say, we did brilliant to get where we did. And from where we come from, from when George Ram took over to get where we did, we were sort of yeah. almost overachieving. So there's no disgrace when, when we did get relegated. But before we get relegated, of course, John Dockey gets sacked. Do you remember that? The Dock leaving the club? He got sacked on the Monday. and uh, we. We had a day off on a Tuesday and we all got together and we met in Tells pub over in uh, Walthamstow. We were devastated for him. Yeah, very, very close. Frank was very upset. Frank wore his heart on his shoulder. Very, very upset. I think it was harsh. I think now what we've done, he should have given, he should have given him an opportunity. Uh, but yeah, I think that's just typified where football, what, what football's about, isn't it? Mm. You know, um, Oh, I was disgusted with it, but what can you do? What can you do? I'll try and carry on. Did Bob Pearson come in and take over momentarily before he we did. got the job? Yeah, and there was Davis, the chairman, was saying all the right things to Bob about getting the job, and Bob was he was thinking and planning ahead as if he was getting the job, and then he got stabbed in the back, which was not unusual. Yeah, and, and, uh, and Frank care. Sibley. Yeah, Frank Sibley was very upset as well. Good coach, Frank Sibley. Um, so it was Reg Bird, was it Reg Bird, a chairman at this point? Reg Bird, yeah, yeah. We had a great relationship with Reg. Reg Bird had a great relationship with everyone. But I was surprised that they didn't give the dock another season to rebuild and come again. You know, mm. if you think like when if you when you go on to Bruce, I'm sure you will. That um, he made some signings. And we challenged the following year. Now, who's to say that Doc couldn't have done that with a nucleus of the same squad, add again and go again? It could have been different. Teddy went on to score 30, 40 goals. You know. There was obviously <laughs> there was obviously money to there to spend. I think didn't did we bring in Malcolm Allen at that point back into that season? Malcolm Allen came in through uh, Bob, Bob Pearson. Yeah. Bob Pearson. Mm, very good friend. And he spent a lot of time with him. Obviously, I played with him in the Welsh. But um they started to throw money around once we got relegated, which I find weird. Yeah. yeah. So Bruce Rioch gets a job. Not many people get slagged off on this podcast, but Bruce Rioch just gets buried by every player that comes on the plate under Bruce him. Bruce Rioch was, for me, I mean, the way he treated me was a disgrace. Uh, the I'll, I'll go for it happily. Um, Bob Pearson offered me a two-year contract. Uh and I was reluctant to sign at the time because I wanted to play. I, I played, you know, I'd done well. Bruce Riot came to me and he said, I'd like you to sign a two-year contract. <laughs> I heard stories of him. He came in stone-faced, clean-shaven, oh, miserable. You know, if you come into that every morning, you'd, you'd, you'd rather go work in a, in a car seat than spend time with him. And uh, he, I said to him, look, I'll sign a year uh, on, the, on the proviso that my birthday is November the 5th. And by November the 5th, if you don't want me or we can't get forward, then you put me on the transfer list. And he said, fine. So I had a great pre-season. I played every game, started the season. I played every game for 11 or 12 games undefeated. 
which took me up to the 2nd of November. Mm. And he put me on, he put me on a transfer list. So I'm thinking, what more can you do? We're undefeated, I'm midfield. I'm doing the anchor role for Alex Ray. Alex Ray's going scoring, blah, blah, blah. I'm holding, getting kicked, tackling, blah, you know, not doing, just doing the boring, the boring role as such. And uh, we're undefeated. And he puts me on transfer list. That's a funny one because like I looked and obviously I saw you, I saw you started the first eight or nine games of the season. Yeah. And then you yeah. just sort of vanished. So I thought, and then you come back in a couple of times as a sub, and I thought, did you get injured? Did he not fancy you? No, I, I, I got injured. Games? I got injured at Swindon, uh, where we was undefeated, part of that run. I got injured at Swindon and I was out for a couple of games. Um, and then obviously that, that deadline came up the second of November. And he put me on the list. And I kind of said to him, what more can anyone do? So we started the season where you didn't want me to turn your head, played the first 11, 12 games, we're undefeated. I think it warrants, you know, I think I've done everything my end of the stick, you know, sort of thing. Mm. And he put me on transfer list. He left me roasting all year in the reserves, declined various offers for various players. Um, I was one of them, I was told by Graham all top when I left. Um, so he declined them. And what really, really got my back up is that I went alone to Peterborough and got promoted with Peterborough, what is what the old fourth division. And they wanted to sign me desperately in the summer. And he prevented that from happening. So when all the teams come back and they get their squads together, they, you know, got their squad, the pre-season, they go to start the season. He then released me in September when everyone was fully Got the players they needed. Yeah. Well, what, was, what was his fucking problem? He was just a, a, not a nice man. He, 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 the Millwall spirit broke. He couldn't, he couldn't, he, he had nothing that was Millwall. He, he had no affiliation to any of anything that we stood for. Nothing. Well, the whole DNA of the club, he just, he, was, he just wasn't right. No. no, he wanted to change it. He thought he was bigger than the club. And, uh, no, nah, he was, you know, <coughs> I'm talking from my personal experience. Uh, everyone else has had their own experience, but the way he treated me was, mm. was a, was a disgrace. And uh, listen, we've had loads yeah. of people on the show, mate, and you're definitely, definitely not alone. So eventually, you do leave the club. How did yes. that come about? Well, he gave me a free transfer, which was, you know, at the uh, at the time uh, in September, and Peterborough had already had their allocation uh, of their squad allocation, spent their money, as most clubs did at that time. And then John had, John Dock had gone to Bradford, and he came in for me straight away, oh, right. and. I didn't realise Doc went to Bradford. Yeah, yeah, John and Bob Pearson, John John Doc and Bob Pearson both Bob went to Pearson, Bradford. Was he was still a scout, Bob Pearson? Or did he get? I just where he just worked his whatever capacity, but he was, he was uh, Doc's number two, uh, and they took me up there. My, my daughter was born uh, on the eleventh of September, my first born. So he let me go seven days before my daughter, uh, uh, nine days before my daughter was born. Uh, oh. With no club, with a week's money. Nice man. So, Doc took me up there, and that was a strange place because they don't like us up there. They don't like us at all. And I'm glad to say that I don't like them either. So, it suits me, it suits me down to the ground. Um, apparently, I was voted in there one of their worst teams ever, but which I find amazing considering the, where they are now in the league. You know, uh, they were just, you know, that, that Yorkshire. Southern Divide. Yorkshire is a, cap, is a country on its own. You've got to get a passport when you get into Yorkshire. Doc was building again. He had a young team. Stephen Torpe, Phil Babb, Alan Dowson, and Darren Tracy went up there. But Darren went walkabout. No one ever seen him again. Um, <laughs> don't know what happened there. Wesley Reid. Um, oh, so you got three the old heads in there. You got three the old heads yeah. in there. And, 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 and when they let him go, we were ninth. We were ninth in the league. And they just... The chairman wasn't strong enough. He was getting a bit of stick from... Uh, the fans and the chairman didn't have a, didn't have, didn't have a guts, so he got rid of Doc. Um, so you you outstayed Doc. You outstayed Doc. At I did, yeah, yeah. And luckily, I'd only signed. Doc offered me a three year contract, and I said no. I signed a year because me and my wife we was paranoid that my daughter would grow up speaking Northern, and it wasn't happening. It couldn't happen. I told him there was part. It was a pivotal part of my contract. I can't have my daughter speaking like someone from Bradford. And so. <laughs> It wasn't happening. So I signed a year to see how it went. It was the best thing I ever did. They brought in Frank Stapleton and, and Bruce's friend, Colin Todd. It's like they'd sent, the demon had been sent to haunt me again. 
you know. Sorry, I don't know why I'm laughing. It's the way you're telling it, that's decent. It is. The demon came up again. He said, I've heard all about you. I said, I oh, know. Yeah, I bet mm. you. Well, Thank God I've only got a year. And, you know, so, and I played, I played, I've done all right. They just didn't. Everything, I, but they tried so hard to get rid of me. And it was nothing to do with football. Because it, it couldn't have been because I was playing all right. Um, it was just, I don't know, it was just a Bruce thing. Bruce thing, I don't know. He just followed me around. That was it. <laughs> I've, I've, I've done this season. I don't think Frank Staple would survive after that season. He couldn't manage. You know, I've had better managers in my bar than that, you know. So, <laughs> so talking about your bar, what are you up to these days? Well, my wife and I were on two pubs, one in Gravesend on the river called Rum Punchin, and we've got another one in Hove, a little pub called uh, The Bottom's Rest. Don't, mind, don't, don't laugh at the name, <laughs> Bottom's Rest. It's, a, it's after a play, a Shakespeare play. So yeah, I, you say, I shouldn't have as well because of its location, but you go on. Yeah, but yeah, we've got two pubs. We bought them three weeks apart in November 2017. And uh, apart from the lockdown, we were doing all right. We did very well. Yeah. Good, mate. Good, so, mate. Yeah. You always talk at the end of the sh- at the end of the show, going back to Millwall, forgetting Bruce Rio and forgetting Bradford. Fuckers. Yeah. Yeah. You're, um, if you could pick a standout memory from your time at the club, uh, I think I just I, I, I go on the Mill history and I look at people's comments about the teams and the old teams and the day and this and the other. And uh, I think for me, you mentioned it the day uh, we we knew. That we would be top of the league against QPR. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to be in that team. It was only for one day because Liverpool played on the Sunday and they won and they replaced us. But it was a great night that night. We all went out. But that was important. That was a great day coming off the pitch. The Blackburn game, losing 4 1 took the edge off it a bit, to, mm. be, to be fair. Uh, but once that sunk in and we no one really gave a toss after that, really, they just got into the celebration aspect of it, really. But, you know, those. From Hull to the Blackburn, that week was phenomenal. Wherever you went, you was just treated like unbelievable, you know. And <clears throat> I always just went back to my little, my little local with my pals that I grew up with, who my schoolmates that I took to the PFA do and sat around the table with Bruce Brobelar and John Barnes and had stories with them and they're sitting there like this thinking, oh God, it was, you know. And they still remember talking about it, it was eight, eight pound a bottle of cold burgers. They remember that bit. You know? <laughs> I remember you treated them to a night out. But it's funny, yeah. you said, go back to your little local, and you do, you, I've heard other stories of other players doing that, but of course, your little local, with your mates you grew up with, was smack bang in the middle of Mill territory, and that was all Mill fans, so. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the day, I mean, it was just, they went everywhere. I mean, a good friend of mine, he's well known to everyone, Mark McAnally. He goes every game, he's, he's a long, staunch Mill fan. Um, he, he was lifelong family friend. We grew up on the same same landing. And the people I grew up with, you know, they come to watch me play. And it was, <coughs> it was amazing. He never changed. I never changed and they never changed. Mm. You know, nothing changed. So that was the beauty of it already. Brilliant, mate. Absolutely. Listen, look, I admire you for living it, for, you know, a dream come true, not just a not just a Mill player, but a Mill fan growing up around the area and achieving it all, mate. Unbelievable. I know you said you had a, a close-knit group as a whole, but I'm going to push mm. you off. You had to take tomorrow one last night out with three of your ex mill teammates. Oh. Who's your top three? You can only take three. You and three others. Well, I'd have to say only me and only are quite close. We've always been quite close, even though he's got the biggest head I've ever seen. <laughs> um, oh, it's a really tough one because, oh, God. Only, only. I'll go back to the youth team. You know, we used to call him Razor, Razor, Rudder. It was close, but Neil, Neil went on to bigger and better things. And when he came back, he was always more inclined to be with Ted and Tell and that. Chicken George, my old mate Georgie Lawrence was was a fantastic. And I was quite close with Alan Dowson towards the end. People mm. like that, and they were what kind of my friends. You know, George, Alan Dowson, Big Tomo, Tomo was great. I'd be hard to pick three. I'll tell you, Orny was Orny was been there from day one. Uh, and we speak still. Um, I'm close to Jimmy Carter, very close. I did like his first Asian football thing the other day that he came up with. Beg to differ on that one, but because uh, <laughs> yeah. my dad was actually born in Calcutta, but I'm not Indian. Really? He is an Anglo Indian. Yeah, he is an Anglo Indian, but I'm an Anglo Indian Ipswich fan as well. 
Well, that's where he, where he came from. He came from Calcutta, and he ended up living in Ipswich. That's why he came to support Ipswich Town. Oh, I mean, Orny, Orny, Tomo, Dash. They're all, you know, they, you, you could go out with any three at any time and be in good company. It really, really will make any difference. You know, I used to get stick. I used to get more stick than most. You can't give that stick about in their days because there'd be there'd be a claim in court every fifty every fifteen minutes. You know what I mean? All he did tell one story. I couldn't put it out, but um, it involved Alan Walker. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Oh God! Yeah, yeah. My bum's. I've just been for a five mile walk today. And my bum's still sore, thinking about. It. No, but, but that's part of what it was, wasn't it? And <coughs> even the chairman come down the next morning and said to me, "How was it for you, Sam?" You know, not very good, Chen. Thank you very much. But, you know, things like that, you know, I mean, thing is, before they came in the room, they was all giving me a beating as well. I was a bit pissed off with that. And then this thing came towards me. He didn't do that. He just slapped it on my ass. But, yeah, it's not it's not a normal procedure, is it? No, mate. No, no, no. It's not. But, um, mate, not some of memories. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, no worries. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.